Yang berbahagia Profesor Tan Sri Datuk Wira Dr. Sharifah Hamsa, Syed Hassan Shahabuddin, Vice Chancellor University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Nur Azlan Ghazali, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and International Affairs UKM. Professor Ezra F. Vogel, Henry Ford II, Professor of the Social Sciences Emeritus, Harvard University. Yang berbahagia Distinguished guests, senior officers of UKM, ladies and gentlemen Good afternoon and thank you for gracing this afternoon's occasion Professor Ezra F. Vogel, Selamat datang and welcome to University of Bangsa and Malaysia It is indeed our pleasure to welcome all of you to our beautiful campus in conjunction with Harvard Ezra F. Vogel Malaysia Singapore Initiative Public Lecture Series. To begin this afternoon's program, it is our pleasure to present University of Bangsa and Malaysia corporate video that represents the activities and achievements of UKM. Ladies and gentlemen, this program involves the participation of professors from Harvard University and it is co-organized by UKM, Harvard University Asia Center and Lam Kim Jung Morning Sun Charity Fund. Without further ado, the floor would like to invite Yang berbahagia Profesor Tan Sri Datuk Bira Dr. Sharifah Hapsa Said Hassan Shahabudi to deliver the welcoming speech. Please welcome. Vice Chancellor, Monsieur Professor Datuk Nur Azlan, who is also in charge of international affairs. 
Uh, we have uh, Dr. Imran, who's sitting up here, uh, Director of the International Office and Organizer of this series of lecture. Distinguished guests, professors and students of UKM, a warm welcome to all of you, and also guests. I think we have guests from outside. Warm welcome to all of you today. We will be listening to the fifth lecture in the Harvard Ezra Bogle Malaysia Singapore Initiative, which is hosted by UKM. In Singapore, it is hosted by the Nanyang Technological University, or NTU. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Lam Kin Chung, who usually comes for the lecture, but unfortunately this time is unable to make it, and his morning sun charity for sponsoring this initiative. And of course, for bringing eminent scholars. Uh, as you saw from the posters outside, we've had Professor Sugata Boss, the first, uh, the one, the first one to give us the lecture. He's the guardian of Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs. Then we had a very enlightening lecture by Professor Tu Wai Mei, who is now in Beijing. Professor Dennis Incarnation and Professors Byron and Mary Good. Um, we've all entered those lectures and uh, it, they have been very informative and thought provoking. Now this film lecture is very special. It will be delivered by the man after whom this lecture series is named. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce this fifth speaker of the Harvard Ezra Professor Emeritus Ezra Vogel of Harvard University. And also a very interesting topic. Actually, I wanted him to come for the first lecture because it was named after him. Then I discovered today he was busy writing this book about Deng Xiaoping and the transformation of China. So that's his topic. He's finished the book and now he has come. I'm so glad we'll be listening to Deng Xiaoping and the transformation of China and its relations with Southeast Asia. A very transformational man. Now, as we listen to him, I would like to ask all of us to reflect also on our national transformation program. And so we want to to also meet the Prime Minister. But unfortunately, he's leaving for Jeddah right now for the funeral of uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. So, I think we can perhaps draw parallels on the GDP and the private sector-led ETP under the overarching One Malaysia People First Performance Now paradigm. And that's supposed to shift Malaysia into a high-income, inclusive and sustainable nation. And if you can draw the parallels, I think Professor Vogel will be pleased to answer your questions later. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Vogel is the Henry Ford the second Professor Emeritus at Harvard University in the Social Sciences. He has had an interesting career beginning with service in the U.S. Army for two years, followed by studies in sociology and graduating with a PhD from Harvard in 1958. Then he went on to Japan, so he can speak Japanese, and today I heard him speaking Mandarin to our Chinese students who are from China. Some of them are students of this same university, and some have come from the other universities around Kuala Lumpur. And uh, of course, you went back, you didn't stay with Yale, although you went to Yale first, but joined Harvard as a postdoc, studied Chinese and history. And you have been with Harvard, I think, since then. Um, we, I think we have given a very nice CV, and you all have it, what he has done in Harvard and outside Harvard, um, and also director of, I think, intelligence, I think, under Clinton, I checked whether it was under Bush or under Clinton, and he said under Clinton. Under Clinton, yeah, not, not Bush, nor the senior, nor the junior. Good. You, uh, he has published extensively too. You can have a look at the list of books. They're very interesting. And um, that's available. You can uh, 
I think it's available in the Kuala Lumpur bookstore. We, sh we should have given out the, the CD earlier so they could go out, buy the books and get him to sign. His scholarly achievement is widely acknowledged. He has received the Japan Foundation Prize and the Japan Society Prize. And also elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And um, his expertise was also sought by the American government, as I told you, under Clinton, and he served as National Intelligence Officer for East Asia and the National Intelligence Council in Washington. Professor Vogel is married to Charlotte, who is a professor of anthropology, emeritus professor at Case Western University. And he's very proud that his three children are also teaching in universities. They are closely allied, I guess, psychology, political economy, and the environment. So ladies and gentlemen, let us give a warm welcome to Professor Ezra. Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Uh, Himran, and uh, uh, members of the audience. It's a great pleasure for me to be back in Malaysia uh, to have a chance to talk to you today. <clears throat> I first came to uh, Malaysia a little over 30 years ago at the time of the Look East policy after I had written my book called Japan is Number One. And it was a great pleasure uh, to take part in your efforts uh, to learn about uh, Japan. Uh, I've uh, had an opportunity to meet a number of your leaders and to be here several times since that time. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be back here uh, today. <clears throat> when I was uh, retiring uh, from Harvard University in the year 2000, I felt I had a responsibility not only to my own students, uh, but to the general Western public as well. Uh, I had the, uh, at least the illusion that my book on Japan, Japan's number one, helped wake up Americans uh, to the rise in Japan and that they ought to learn more about it. Uh, I did not need to tell people today uh, that China is rising. Everyone knows that. I think the responsibility of a scholar is to try to understand better the nature of that rise and the nature of the country. And when I was thinking in the year 2000 what to write about, I decided that the logical topic was Deng Xiaoping and his era. For it was in the period from 78 to 1992, when Deng was leading China, that the great transformation of China took place. And in my opinion, the path that he laid down essentially set the path that China has fallen even today. Uh, sometimes in the history of the nation, there is a particularly formative period when new ideas and new institutions take shape. And I believe that is true of uh, the case of China and Deng Xiaoping. What I want to do today is to trace briefly the history, to concentrate especially on his effort to learn about the outside world. Because Deng Xiaoping, insisted on the complete opening of China and sending students abroad, sending uh, people to contact foreign businesses, encouraging foreign businesses to invest in China, opening up the country in a very <coughs> wide way. Since I'm uh, giving this talk in Southeast Asia, I want to emphasize today the importance of his transformation in China for the transformation of relations uh, of China to Southeast Asia. When he came to Southeast Asia in November 1978, uh, at that time, uh, China was still a revolutionary country. And it was pro 